Hi, everybody. This is Work in Progress, an exploratory gallery podcast where you will hear from artists, staff, collaborators, and even different hosts as you follow along and listen to each episode. I'm Kemi Craig, guest curator for the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria's Blueprints for the Afrofuture programming series and your host for the day. This episode is being recorded and produced on the traditional lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, also known as Songhees and Esquimalt nations. In this episode, we will reflect on some of the questions that we asked artists and community members to ponder throughout this year-long series, such as, why is the act of gathering so important? Where are the places where we can connect? How do we connect our various communities? What kinds of spaces do we need? How do we learn about and support local Black presence and experiences? Building on the work of artist Denise Tomasos, whose paintings speak to the experience of the African diaspora and were previously on view at the AGGV from December 11th, 2021 to March 13th, 2022, this series resulted in a number of collaborations with Black artists and collectives from across BC. Folks like Charles Campbell, Justine A. Chambers, Joshua Genda, Angie Riley, DJ Nova Jade, Hidden Variable Sound Collective, Ruby Smith Diaz, Karen aka DJ Jokey Jokey, and Iaverse generously created art and offerings that spoke to the importance of recognizing Blackness in BC, which eventually inspired Portal to the Afrofuture, an immersive celebration of music and dance that took place on February 3rd, 2023. Our hope is that this podcast episode will help extend the learning that happened through this unique program and be a way to share the creative ideas and art and offerings more broadly with family, friends, and communities who might want to learn more. The title Blueprints for the Afrofuture actually came from a conversation with Chief Curator Jamie Isaac, where she was expressing her reaction to the work of Denise Tomasos. And in it, she was saying how the work, how Denise's work was able to capture hope, even though Denise is talking about um, these institutions of oppression. And she said that they, the work, the paintings looked like blueprints for the Afrofuture. And I thought that would be a lovely title for a series of programming um, so that artists would have an opportunity to create this um, idea of like, what does the Afrofuture sound like? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And so the idea was that the work that people created, it wouldn't stop and end with the offering that they made, but rather it would be something that is a design that we could take forward into the future. And this idea of continuation is also how the name of the celebration of the programming series, Portal to the Afrofuture, came about because there was an idea that we weren't concluding, we weren't ending anything, but rather we wanted something that was moving into the next phase of this idea, these expressions of the Afrofuture. Part of the inspiration for Blueprints of the Afrofuture and the way that it was programmed was a desire to showcase some of the local artists that were of the African diaspora because the experience of Blackness in these territories is quite unique in terms of um, the context of Blackness in other parts of Turtle Island. And Denise Tomasos's work uh, stemmed from the context of being in larger cities, more urban environments. And here, um, Black communities, we tend to operate almost more in silos. And so we were seeking this way of connecting the various communities and and find how do we find out about the work that each other is doing? How do we find out about um, how we can collaborate and what our different skills are and where are opportunities of um, connection, of collaboration, of skill sharing, 
Um, and just also places to gather. And w one of the most moving experiences for me about being at the portal to the Afro future was looking around the space and seeing how much joy, and in particular, like how much black joy there was in the room. Um, the ability to come together and and celebrate and dance and, and hear and experience art that is made by us and, and that centers our experiences is a very unique um, experience for me and I think others like me here in Victoria. I would love to speak a little bit to an example of some of the artists that are working here in BC but didn't know about each other but are complete powerhouses. And that was part of the inspiration to bring Justine A. Chambers together with Charles Campbell so that they could interview each other as artists. Um, both have a performance practice and a practice with working through the body, with working through time, memory, the body as an archive. Um, this idea of moving through the context of past, present, and future simultaneously. And because Justine lives and works in Vancouver and Charles lives and works here in Victoria, but also they work in different mediums. Justine is a contemporary dancer in Vancouver and Charles works across Canada at this point, but much of his work happens in the visual arts realm. And so often um, between the different disciplines, artists may not know about each other. Um, and so it was so lovely to bring the two of them together and to watch how that relationship will grow. And I hope that in the future they may work together or collaborate. Um, and similarly, the DJs that played the closing event, um, DJ Nova Jade, who actually opened the series as well and opened the series with a virtual experience um, and then was able to be here in person for uh, the portal event where she was able to connect with like there were different generations of DJs that were playing that night. And that was really lovely to see. I would almost say that in terms of what artists shared with me after the experience and after um, sharing the art that they created, that in some ways is surprising is that for some of them, it was one of the first times that they were able to be showcased in a gallery um, context. Um, some of them are, are kind of like senior artists in, in the landscape of like the art world and working in galleries um, like Justine and, and Charles and um, I'd say Josh Genda to a certain extent as well. Um, but some of the artists like Angie Riley, as well as Ruby Smith Diaz, even though they've been doing a lot of really profound work in community, you know, have have authored books that were um, published, as well as um, had kind of how do I put it? Had kind of the. Uh, the experience of being able to facilitate in community. Um, for some, like Ruby Smith Diaz, it was her first time presenting in a gallery. And, and so for me, that was a real gift because I've seen some of the artists' work develop over years. And it's nice that as a guest curator that's being invited in, that's like from the communities that you want to center, then being able to say, hey, there are actually all these hidden gems in the community. How do we give their work uh, a wider audience? And like, how do we show like um, more folks in, in communities that actually there are artists that, that like 
look like you and me that are doing incredible work in community, and here's an opportunity to come and see that. Um, Nicole Stambridge, who is the former curator of engagement, basically invited me in and said, what what would you like to do? We, we'd like you to do something that's in response and in relationship to Denise's work. And w- what are your ideas and what are your thoughts about like what you would like to do in terms of programming a series? And I think for myself as an artist and also like I was just sharing with Jamie Isaac um, that my first kind of experience in the art world was a program called uh, Curatorial Incubator that was offered through the Western Front. And it was for me, um, emerging curators to have an opportunity to be matched with a mentor. And there's something for me about having that ex- experience of being an emerging artist or curator that's partnered with someone that has the skill set that you need to develop and the experiences that you want to learn from. And I think I, it's not so much that I saw myself necessarily as a mentor, but I saw myself as someone who had the opportunity to share space. And knowing that there's so much talent here, it was an easy kind of like, of course, these are the people that I would like to share space with. The way that I got my start, I often dreamed of being an artist. I actually, initially I wanted to be a filmmaker because I saw this film from Robert Townsend called Hollywood Shuffle, where it features these actors that are living in Hollywood and they were also black and they were talking about how they wanted to go and audition for roles where they got to play the superhero or, you know, the kind of like person that solves a mystery. But the roles that they were getting cast in were these like really problematic, stereotypical roles. And it was the first time that I saw a film that really reflected my experience. Like there was, I often felt like I was trying to brush up against this narrative of me that was in place before I even arrived. And so initially I wanted to be a filmmaker, but I was living in South Carolina and went to an art gallery in Charleston where Lorna Simpson's work was being featured. And before that, I didn't really understand or really connect with contemporary art. I liked some more... Um, well, I won't go with what I, I just, I, I didn't quite understand abstraction and I didn't understand a lot of contemporary work. Like it didn't really land with me until I saw Lorna Simpson's work. And that's where I was like, I, I completely felt seen and that, um, the way that she, position things like hair pieces and angles that she used in photography, I just found really um, inspiring, really intriguing, and something clicked, and I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to become an artist. So eventually, I did go to art school, but I started by just kind of volunteering at a local film co-op, and from there, got a little experience making Super 8 films and taking workshops in community. And I used that for my portfolio to go to art school. And when I went to school, it seemed like the first thing that they did was everyone that had a a more traditional medium or a more conventional medium, whether it be painting or film, their whole thing was like, well, how, what can you do with that? How can you break out of that box. And so it was also one of the first times that I had to, that I had the experience of creating outside these kind of like normative ways of working. And so I got to learn about um, 
things like expanded cinema and uh, multimedia installation and how I could combine both my love of dance and moving with visual art. And so currently I combine things like analog film with some newer media technologies like projection mapping as well as augmented reality technology. And I use that in relationship to um, movement and and projections and and create both um, site-specific performances as well as installations. And I'm looking forward to like in my practice developing even more immersive and more engaged um, installations and performances and experiences. Um, but I would definitely say being an interdisciplinary artist is what made my way of working, I think, as a curator as well in programming these series, that it would be inter interdisciplinary in nature as well. Um, because I feel like in the real world, we experience things in, in so many different ways. Like the real world is a, a multi-sensory experience. And so I think I often crave um, that kind of like multi-sensorial uh, experience also when, when I'm out in the world and I'm going to shows. And I think I want to share those experiences with with others. In connecting with Ruby Smith Diaz after the entire um, series was uh, moving towards celebration, one of the things that she noted and picked up on was the importance of accessibility being centered in the Afrofuture, that without um, accessibility and and this centering of care and community, there is no Afro future. And so in terms of the development of the program and, and where we would like to see things develop in the future and how we like things to develop, it was very important to have both virtual off offerings as well as in-person offerings so that um, people could feel safe and have experiences that were empowering and inspiring in the safety and the comfort of their homes. And um, I think even in relationship to the in-person uh, sessions, like being able to have some of the in-person components have live elements so that people um, had a window of access into an, the event. And I think also making sure that there was content that um, that will continue to exist on the website and on the page for Blueprints for the Afro Future so that people can revisit these experiences that maybe are not able to come out but have different ways of accessing content. Um, and I think another layer that I would love that I'm in the process of learning myself as an artist is, um, for example, audio description. So when you're creating visual work, when you're creating a, a movement-based performance, like how do you add that other layer of access by being able to, you know, poetically describe what's happening in this performance, like how a dancer is moving, what the visuals, um, how they appear and and so that there are different ways of sensing and experience all of the offerings and artwork being created. A question that I had for myself and with this programming was how, how can we as, as the greater community, how can we support um, and elevate like black presence and black experiences in our local communities. And one of the things that I appreciated was uh, first of all, the invitation, uh, because that alone created 
it, it removed a barrier of like trying to access public spaces, public institutions. Um, and so I think the idea of thinking broadly about how institutions and how artist galleries and other public entities embedded in communities can be a part of um, honoring Black presence and Black experiences in, in the greater community. Um, I think it's important to remember this idea of by us for us that it needs to be someone that is actually embedded in community that understands what needs are and and you know black experiences aren't a monolith either and so you know i know one tiny kind of corner of experiences uh but i do find that in being able to at least connect with other people. Um, it is important to have someone where potentially there is like a shared present day experience or um, even if it's one from, from like stemming from your past or like your, your deeper cultural experiences that is kind of like doing the work and having, that has the lens of the nuances of what's happening locally. Um, because it's always good to start right where you are before you're branching out into larger pictures because starting right where you are is informing, is a part of that informing of a larger picture. and. And working the other way around, like the the big picture is also informing kind of what's happening in these, um, like in smaller contexts. And so I would say, in a way, when I mention the experience that I had where as someone that had the interest and had the dream, but didn't necessarily have an in into spaces that um, have the gallery and have the space and have the funding um, to create more programs for people to experience as, as, as an emerging um, artist or an emerging curator, to create more experiences like that, to develop that within community where people that already have the, the knowledge of organizing events, but often gallery galleries and other institutions are just speaking a different language. And so maybe if galleries and other institutions thought a little bit more about how they can learn um, more fluidity in their language and like the ability to understand that the way that they speak is not it's not the only way of speaking, it's not the only way of moving in community, and that they have just as much to learn from community members as uh, a community member can share in that, like, um, that loop of knowledge that can be shared by bringing someone in and saying, like, you know, here are ways that your work, that your artwork can can develop and go further, like have a broader reach. And that the work that is being created by artists, um, that the gallery is kind of learning other ways of, of working and being in community, like centering care, um, like centering process, rather than just a product. And yeah. Part of the reason that this programming series that I was really inspired to engage with this idea of the Afro future. And, you know, and there's more than one future, you know, there it's futurism, the futures, um, futurities, like it, it's definitely plural in, in its experience. Um, but I think what 
for me, I find so empowering is that notions of futurism and specifically Afrofuturism that imagine um, Blackness as being embedded in a part of the future. Um, what I find really exciting is that there is a way of you get to think outside of what already is and create something new. So I'm really drawn to things like speculative narrative, science fiction, fantasy, things like that, because they allow you to take your experience and really create this whole other world. And I had this history professor, Dr. Georgia Satara, and she said, you know, we work, she works a lot around anti-racism, anti-Semitism. And I remember in class her telling us, she's like, you know, I know that we're here and we're doing this work and activism and, and, you know, trying to end these things that are problematic. But if you don't have the ability to imagine a new world and what that might look like, then what are you moving towards? It's one thing to take something apart, but you need to be able to create what you're moving towards. And so that was kind of why I was so inspired and really wanted to focus on Afrofuturism. And also with one of the things that I find unique with um, Afrofuturism and indigenous futurities is that there is this honoring and respect and understanding of the knowledge of our ancestors and that is brought into the future. And also this understanding of time not happening in a linear sense, but time almost like being collapsed or folded in on itself. And you're experiencing past, present, future simultaneously. And so I'm really drawn to artists that also kind of like promote and amplify that idea. Thank you so much for joining me, and a huge thank you to Charles Campbell, Justine A. Chambers, Joshua Genda, Angie Riley, DJ Nova Jade, Hidden Variable Sound Collective, Ruby Smith Diaz, DJ Jokey Jokey, and Iaverse for contributing to the programming. Work in Progress is programmed through the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria in Victoria, BC, Lekwungen Lands, and is generously supported by a Canada Council for the Arts Digital Now grant. For those who want to learn more about Blueprints for the Afrofuture, visit aggv.ca.